Okay. Turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. This whole day has been amazing. I, I think the theme, uh, seeing Janice and Diego share, and Janice seeing her tears uh, for being in awe and so overwhelmed and grateful to understand what yes. one soul, what it takes for one soul to understand the truth in this battle. And seeing Millie coming really to the point where she understands Jesus is awesome and he is going to be her Lord and she's going to be saved today in the waters of baptism. It's amazing to see that. And then understanding the missions. Uh, really, many of us here were baptized in Orlando. This church was planted about five years ago from a thought and a movement in Los Angeles that brought out a group of people led by Matt and Helen. Many of you were met and invited and showed the truth step by step in a way that you never, even though you went to churches, you learned more Bible and just the, the studies that you had to learn to become a true disciple than you ever had in your life, myself included, in 93. I was baptized in Los Angeles from a movement of people that were sent from Boston and other places with, from missions money that sent them and they moved to Los Angeles, 50 people in 89. And in 93, that church had grown to 5,000. And I was asked to come to church. And I grew up going to church all my life. And when I was asked by disciples and they studied the Bible with me and got with me personally and gave me their friendship and their life and they shared their sins and I wasn't alone and they showed me step by step biblically what it means to be a Christian, what, what, how to repent, why am I in darkness, how, what is the kingdom, where is the church, why this church, what are we doing, and they showed me first century Christianity, and that's what we're doing around the world, and we continue to do, we're not better than anybody, we're just the people that said it can be done if we let the scriptures lead our lives and we strive to imitate them and repent when we see that, and don't add or take away, and that is what the scriptures need to do, the first century teachings must be in the church today and lived out by true disciples. Amen? Amen? Turn your Bibles to verse 19. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He bore, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. For his wounds, by his wounds, we have been healed. For you were like a sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd, the overseer of your souls. The Bible says here that it's commendable to suffer under pain, even if it's unjust and it's not fair and it wasn't your fault and you've been put in a terrible situation. God says, I see it. And it's commendable. If you're conscious of me, God. He says, it's, in verse 19, it is commendable if someone bears up under pain of unjust suffering. You didn't deserve it. It's wrong for persecution or whatever reasons. Because they are conscious of God. Meaning you trust God and you don't have to fight yeah. to defend yourself. And that's why it follows up with Jesus didn't retaliate. They had him, they were beating him. He could have taken everybody on. He could have went on. He could have, he could have came off that cross and says, game over. It's not worth it, Father. They're not worth dying for. They're lot, just destroy it. He said, no, most of them aren't going to go for it, but I'm still going to trust you, God, and die. Yeah. I don't need to fight. I'm going to let them beat me and torture me and spit on me. I don't need to. I know that this is your divine way. And over the time, there will be many that will understand what I'm doing. Amen. And there'll be many more that won't want to do it. How are you at bearing up under unjust treatment and pain 
and being conscious of God at the same time and realize that God has got a reason for it. He's not putting you in, he hasn't forgot about you. He's not in China doing work and he's just overloaded. He goes, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't be overseeing this unjust stuff that happened to you. Wow. He's in your life. There's a reason. You may not understand the reason, that doesn't matter. We're going to see a great example. The title of this lesson is From the Penthouse to the Prison with God. Look in, look in Genesis chapter 39. And you know, the title really was From the Pedestal to the Pit to the Penthouse to the Prison. But I'll explain why. It's a little too long. How you doing? But it actually fits. We're going to pick it up with Joseph, who, when he was brought up among his family, he was very arrogant. And he was, a, and, and, and he was, he was someone that bragged about himself, and he, and he put himself in a spotlight where his brothers hated him. And they actually tricked him and trapped him in a pit. And he was taken as a slave, sold into slavery by the Ishmaelites. So he, but, but when he was at home, he was on the pedestal. His dad favored him, which is wrong, more than the other brothers. That's a bad thing to do if you're a parent, by the way. And he was like, he thought he was God's gift. He had, dream, he had a dream. He'd brag about how God's with him. And, you know, have you ever been around someone that's like, like a know-it-all or just they think they're just, you know, they're, they're, they're special. You know, they, it's kind of it's annoying. That's what happened. Now, it didn't give the brothers the right to, to conspir have a conspiracy and put him in a pit. But he did. He got put in a pit and he got sold off to slavery. That's crazy. So he went from the pedestal in his family to the pit. And now he was now he was taken out of the pit by, by the, the Ishmaelites took him. And now here we pick it up in verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him, I mean, excuse me, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So from the pit, the Ishmaelites had him as a slave. And then they went and now he goes to another land. And Potiphar, an Egyptian official, buys him. It's not a good place to be to be in that situation, right? Look at verse 2 right away. It reminds us. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. So we could go, this still's not good. I don't really ask to be taken against my will, put in a pit, then sold to some people as a slave, then transferred over to Egypt and sold again. I have no rights. But he still had a consciousness of God. And it says here in verse 3, when his master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and, may, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From that time, he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned. And the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything in, he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. I'm trying to see if I can find somebody out there. I know, they're too, they'd be, you guys would be too prideful if I use the name. All right, I'll give it up. A brand new dad. Ariel's pointing to Justin. All right, we'll give it up. They just had a baby. Just don't walk around with a swollen head, bro. We'll have to take another two hours to t bring you back down to humility so we can keep you saved. I'm well built and handsome, he told me. Yeah. Now you're in sin and you're getting ready to drift. Let's bring you in. All right, ready? Make sure nobody breathes on the baby. Yes, and please, don't go breathe on the baby. It's a brand new baby, Mary Jane. They're writing a song about her. That name has to have a song written, by the way. Mary Jane, Mary Jane. I don't know how it's going to go, but it's got to go. But please don't go breathe on the baby. You guys, why would I do that? I mean, don't open up and go, how cute. Because babies are susceptible to germs. So you step back and go, hey, congratulations. It's so great. And if it's sleeping, you go, I'll see it again. You don't open it up and go, yeah, 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 yeah. If it's sleeping, you go, oh, great. And then you just go hug the parents. Congratulations. And you walk away and go, I'm so happy for you. And you move on. And you'll get to see the baby another time. Don't touch the baby. Don't touch it. It's her. Guard it. And then let it get its immune system going. And then, you, then later on, aunts and uncles will all be going, nin, 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 like we all do to all the babies, right? 
So now we see here in verse, in ver, at the end of verse uh, seven, 6, says Joseph was well built and handsome. In verse 7, after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern myself, himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's trusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day, and he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Here we see even not a hint of impurity. You notice that he knew he was resisting, but he didn't even put himself in a vulnerable position because he didn't want anybody outside to think something's going down. He goes, he wouldn't even be around her. He tried to plan to do his job, and he, and he, or he wouldn't even be with her. He planned not to put himself, which would be called a hint of impurity, because he already knows he's not doing it, but he was even thinking, I'm going to be above approach. Amen. You see that? Day after day, just laying it out. One day in verse 11, he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her to her household servants. Look, she said to him, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream, he left. And he left his coat, cloak beside me and ran outside the house. So she kept, she, uh, she kept his cloak beside her until her master came home. Then she told him the story. That Hebrew slave you brought to us came to me to make sport of me. And, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story of his wife, telling him and saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Does that not blow you away? And from Peter, remember, we got to go back to Peter. It says, it is commendable if you suffer unjust treatment in the Lord's eyes and are conscious of God. And if you're conscious of God, that means you're being righteous. But you're conscious that God's there. It's not fun. It's tough. But you don't let it take you out. You don't get a bad attitude. You don't become a minimalist worker. You crank. Because that's what they saw. They saw his work ethic. He got in the, wherever he was, he made the lemonade out of lemons. And people noticed him. People in the world noticed this is an amazing employee. Good night. I'm going to put him in charge of everything. They were thinking for themselves, too. He's going to benefit me. But then they continued to see it, and he was already making a statement for God because they knew he was a Hebrew. Yeah, see, you got to let people know you're a Christian. Yeah, you don't yeah. brag. You don't put it down. You don't become the, the weird guy in, in the workplace. But you, you pray for wisdom. It comes out, I'm, I'm a Christian. Yeah. And then you don't have to go on anymore. Then let them see what you do in your work office. Don't be coming in late, running, barely getting the clock every time. Don't be leaving. Don't be sitting on the phone. Don't take extra lunch breaks. Crank. Greet everybody, shake everybody in the hand, pick up a piece of paper when you're walking by. Not because you have to, because I work here and I'm going to do my best. And instead of all the other employees walking by, yeah. you pick it up and go, oh, oh, there's a piece of paper. I get $8 an hour, but I'm still going to help. Because God is my God. God is my God. See, it's an attitude for God. Everything you do, you do for God. And you're not doing, but people will notice that. Yes. Come on, Chris, talk about it. Now, from the penthouse to the prison. He is in prison. And guess what? Some of us, he's in a better position than us right now. I, if I could be in the prison and be the warden in charge and do anything I wanted and then have a special like, apartment for my wife, then I'd go. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just saying, no matter what situation he is, you see the theme in this whole, this whole chapter? The Lord was with him. The Lord was with them. The Lord was with them. 
And if Shannon was up here, she'd be going, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Because that's the theme. It says a little stuff about him, blah, blah, blah. This bad thing happened, this bad thing happened, the Lord was with him, gave him success. This other bad thing happened, it, it wasn't his fault, he was blamed, and even the woman that was shamed lied and said he was trying to rape her. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. That, if the Lord's with you, you've got to be righteous. You can't just go, the Lord's with me. You've got to be righteous and bear up under suffering. When it says bear up under suffering, it says don't go into sin and throw a fit and get a bad attitude and get bitter. Now the Lord's going to be working with you, but he's not going to be with you because he's got to work on your sin. But if you're with him, then you go, wow, this isn't the best situation, but I know God put me here because I'm one of his and there's a reason. Even if it's discipline, there's a reason. But I know he's going to bring me out shining. Yeah. And, I, I'm, and I hope somebody else is shining when I'm done. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Come on, Chris. Look in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Woo. Point number one, all temptations are mind games. Woo. Are you good with your mind? Wow. Are you good with your mind? Can you be played like a flute quickly? Satan can play us. It's a mind game. It's how you think. Your thought process. If you don't allow your thought process to be open and humble, you're prideful, number one. Number two, you're thinking, no, I got it right and I know better. Your thought process is really in trouble. Yeah. Now, you, those who think that way, are already going, how do you know me? You don't know me. How do you, you don't have the right to say that. That's because you're prideful and now you're saying that. Yeah. I'm teaching the word. Come on. Let's look at one. The serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say we must not eat fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden and we must not touch it or, or you'll die. You certainly won't die. Can't you imagine him saying that? Picking it apart. Just trying to pick a little bit of break trust in it. Just break a little bit of a thread to not trust God. A little bit. Because he says, you, you're not going to die. The servant said, it's like he's almost like, he told you that? For God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. He wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you down. He wants to keep the man down. He, he, want, he wants to keep the control issue over you. He's got to have that. He doesn't want you to get even because then he can't control you. He's trying to leverage on you, dude. He said, God knows when you eat it, it, it your eyes are going to be opened. And you're going to be like, you won't even need God anymore. You can just, you, you, why do you want him around? It's another, it's just, you'll deal the go and crank. You... No one, no, you'll know to make the right choices, good and evil. You won't need him anymore. Just go make it happen. Cut, the, you know, cut him out. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking. And God, as he walked in the garden in the cool of the day and hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But God called out to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Now, this is the question here when, when he goes, did God really say you can't eat the fruit? You know, he said, we can't, she goes, we can't eat it and we can't touch it. It's wise not to touch it, but God didn't say you couldn't touch it. So he, he, she wasn't even listening to the word correctly. See, even though that's a good idea, you know, if you're struggling, when you become a Christian, you need, to be, you need to be not sexually immoral, you need to be pure. So God would say, don't go to the nightclub and have sex. But it'd be good not to go to the nightclub, right? Because the nightclub has gyrating music and crazy stuff going on and people are drunk and drugs are going there and people are hooking up. So you're all around that, so it'd be foolish. But the issue really is, is the word of God can get exaggerated. That's why we all have to know our Bibles. It's a good advice, don't touch it. But God didn't say not to touch it, but I don't think it'd be wise to go touch it, right? But what he's really saying there, he said, did God really say? That's what he says to us today. You know, we're talking about the divine war, right? We've had, we've had a series on the spiritual battle, the unseen battle. The biggest divine war now is people being strayed from the truth with a lot of the truth in it. Truth of Christ on the cross, lots of biblical truth in there, but just a little bit enough to sway you 
from believing you're saved, but never getting the group to understand what discipleship is and really understanding God wants to move through his people and he uses his people to carry the truth and love and teach and, and lay their life down. So people really see, wow, this brother sister thing is actually, they're really, they really are family. It's not just, hey brother, hey sister, you know, it's real. Did God really say, you know, God knows your heart. You don't want to be baptized. We got you baptized. God knows your heart. Your parents did, right? You were baptized. You don't remember it, but when you got baptized, it was there. You love God. You feel it, don't you? You love God. That's the way he works on us today. You've got to follow the word. You've got to listen to the words of God. It's not up for you to dispute and go, well, let me rationalize. Maybe that, that's not the way we do it. Then, check this out, in verse 6, Then the woman saw the fruit was good for the, good for the food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some of it and ate it. She also gave it to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You know, if you're a teenager, you grow up, and, and before you're a teenager, the Bible says all people have to be called out of darkness into the light. So God, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But you got to get old enough to realize what your sins are. Yeah. So like if a baby or a young child that can't understand dies without being baptized and becoming a Christian, God says that in the Bible in two places that they're fine. You don't do these ceremonial stuff because you're nervous. They have to understand their sin. They have to actually understand they are in darkness and their eyes need to be open and they start to feel shame. Right. See, when Eve broke the, the sin, she ate the sin and she felt shame. Yeah. She entered darkness. See, they were in the light. Yeah. They entered darkness and went, whoa, I'm feeling guilty and I'm feeling like I got to hide now. Yeah. And see, each of us have to understand ourselves from the scriptures, I'm in darkness. Not just because we tell you that. You've got to go, whoa, that stuff the Bible's talking about, I'm getting really in touch. I'm kind of embarrassed that I've been that way. But you're right, I'm in darkness. Yeah. How do I get in light? That's it. The, um, then we see God's in the garden. He knows they're there. He calls the man in verse 9, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Sin. You go back in the darkness, right? It's like cockroaches on the floor. Hopefully you don't have any, but if, if you had an infested cockroach house and you came back from your vacation and you, you, set, you, you came back home, and you open the door and you turn the lights on in the kitchen, there'll be cockroaches just running around your thing and they just go, Shh, they just scatter. The light turns on, they run. They're scared of the light. They're going to hide. And that's what we do when we're in sin. I'm not calling you a cockroach, but you cockroaches. But I'm saying our nature could be that way because cockroaches hate the light. They run. When we're in sin, human beings that are in sin, not confessing, we don't want to be around others of the light. We kind of are distance. We kind of excuse ourselves because we are feeling naked and we need to hide. Because we're back, we're, we're, we're not repentant. We're in the dark. See what I'm saying? So when you understand the Bible's definitions of sins, you realize, good night. Now I understand why I act like I act. How do I get rid of this stuff and how do I get in the light? Now you're fired up and you start seeking God with all your heart and you, and you start studying the Bible. But listen to this. In verse 11, God says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. This is the first... This is the first throw you under the bus scripture in the Bible. It's the first, this is the first time. It doesn't come up. This is the first throw her, under, throw, her, throw her under the bus scripture. He throws her under the bus. And that's the first one. God's nailing him. He goes, I'm going to throw her under the bus. It's all her. She brought it to me, that little wench, that little nightmare. You made her out of my rib. I didn't, you didn't ask me to make her. I mean, she was fun. I enjoyed her. But she kept, you know, dangling around that tree. Always curious, making excuses like she's cleaning up around the tree. Don't, you don't need to clean up around the tree. Clean up around the other tree. So this is the first throw under the bus scripture in the Bible. 
So she's thrown under, he, he, she, he throws her under the bus, and then we continue, and it just starts dominoing. Verse 13. Then the Lord said to the woman, what have you done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate it. So now she throws the serpent under the bus, and the serpent's just going, how you doing? Because that's Satan's M.O. Guys, this is serious. We must think about the temptations or mind games. The same thing, disobedience is the same thing. It just depends on what sin it is. It doesn't matter. Joseph saw Potiphar's wife, and I promise you, she was desirable to his eyes. I promise you, he had a fine-looking wife. Because when you're that high in the officials and, and Pharaoh, you, 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 that's the way it works. So I promise you, physically, she was probably the physically beautiful. And she was pleasing to the eye. And she was working him every day. Come to bed with me. Come to bed with me. And I promise she wasn't wearing a nun outfit. She was probably working it. That's why he stayed away and didn't come around. And he's a man and he had urges too. I promise you. And she was desirable to the eye. Pleasing to the eye. And he could have even thought too. You know what? This can be some fun and I can get away with it. Why didn't he do that? And then Eve, same sinful heart. Looks at the fruit, pleasing to the eye, desirable. And she went through and disobeyed. See, it's a thought process. It's mind game. Wow. God, the first step is, is God awesome to you? Or have you lost the awesome of God? Because if God is really awesome, then you trust God. And you believe that God knows what's best for your life than you do. So you're going to seek to understand and obey his scriptures, even though the majority of the world's culture says, what? I'm, I, I can live with my girlfriend. That's, everybody does that now. That just because time goes on and everybody goes down the hills doesn't mean the Bible changes, the truth drifts. God just doesn't keep yelling from a microphone. I told you not to be sexually immoral. I told you it's sin. He's done with that. He says once Jesus died, the truth is out. I don't need to say another word. The word's there. You want to seek me? I don't need to keep reminding you of my truth. The Bible's here that reminds you. You don't want to open it, it can become non-truth to you. He wants you to seek him, but you won't find him if you just go along with the culture and don't open your Bible. Because the world, is, we're in a different world when we're not in the Bible. When you're in the Bible, you, well, you're back in God's world. Let's play a video from BB, my incredible assistant. Remember what BB stands for? He's my beautiful boss, Diego, BB. <laughs> BB, can you play that video for me? <laughs> I'm going pro! Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know, you know, uh, you'll probably be about as good as I was. That's kind of the way it works, you know, and I, I, I was below average. You know, so, whoa. So you'll probably ultimately rank somewhere around there, you know, so I really, uh, you'll excel at a lot of things, just not this. I don't want you out here shooting this ball around all day and night. All right? All right. Okay? All right, go ahead. somebody tell you you can't do something not even me all right all right you got a dream you got to protect it people can't do something themselves they want to tell you you can't do it you want something go get it period See, I love that because even the father at first, and you know the dad loved him very much, the dad was sincerely wrong, what he told him. The dad loved him and said, don't, 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 don't play around with this. It's a waste of time. And it discouraged him. See, we need to understand our dream needs to be to please God first. And even if, even if, even if family members and good attention people say, no, don't, we go to this church, what are you doing? And if you're following the Bible and it's challenging their life, then you've got to just go, what? This is what the Bible teaches. And I'm not trying to fight. I don't mean to disrespect you, but I know you mean well because people may try to tell you that 
this is not right or you can't do it. Yeah. A lot of people don't believe that you can have what the Bible says. It's fake. I've been to church. There's no way people can be devoted and committed to the way that says and really be tight and be friends in between and be sold out and, and baptize people and share their faith and continue to sacrifice and be a movement of churches connected all through the world with the same teaching, the same thing everywhere and every place as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4. Well, I got news for you. It can be done if each person humbles their thought process and puts God's thoughts and God's ways and God's word above their agenda and surrenders and understands the awe of God. Amen. You're in a group that's doing it. Come on. Imperfect sinners. Imperfect sinners that aren't, we're going to have bad days and good days, but we're going to continue to repent. No better than anybody else, but we have now decided thought process. We've studied the Bible. This is the truth. Nobody going to tell me I can't do it because I can do all things through Christ. who gives me strength. Okay, so turn your Bibles to John 18, 1. Point number two is how does his name affect you? How does his name affect you? How, you? how easy of a target are you guys? How, how easy can we break, can you get broken down to the point where you're like wondering, is this the truth? Is this the right church? Did people brainwash me? Did I really make the decision myself? Did, was I, was it my, they, they were too nice. They love bombed me. Those people were too friendly. I don't think I really had a chance to understand what I did. Well, then I feel sorry for you. Because yeah. no one puts a gun to anybody's head in this church. In fact, if you come up in this church and you go, wow, I'm fired up. How do I get saved? I go, guess what? We're not going to be able to do it right now. But we can start studying the Bible. And if you don't want to sleep and I can see you really can get it, I need to have you understand enough of God's word and believe it yourself and repent and actually take God's word and then go, I agree. And then you change. Because It's not about me teaching you. I'll just show you. I want to answer all your questions. But you're going to have to change. Right. And that's going to take learning to pray and holding on to God. And it's going to get radical. It's going to get painful. But the longest conversion in the Bible is three days. Yeah. The longest. Today, we have, a lot, we have to unlearn a lot of things. See, in the first century, there wasn't a bunch of churches that had crosses on them talking about Jesus with all different types of traditions. Back then, if Jesus was Jesus, that was it. No, every, it was no brainer. I believe in Jesus. Repent and be baptized. Forgive, yeah. Receive the forgiveness of sins. Give to the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.38. And that's how it went. Now everybody's spread it out. We've all brought up and the power of thought and sentimentality and generations of people we respect that, that may be wrong when you get to the Bible. Now you're confronted going, am I going to follow this or am I just going to massage this? Because these people, I, I know they're, they can't, they've they got to have it right. Yeah. But when you get down to the Bible and go answer every question by the Bible, if there's a problem, you just go, I was wrong, I got to change. Amen. Or I didn't know that. Wow, I'm going to do that. John 18, 1. Now we're talking about our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven and earth. He loves. Yeah, na, 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 na. <laughs> Chapter 18, verse 1. When he had finished praying, Jesus left his disciples and crossed Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. In point two, in, in verse two, they got together often, discipling times. You see how they met? They knew the place. They had a cool place in the Mount of Olives. But it says he knew where it was because the, Jesus often met there with the disciples. They came together and met a lot for D times, discipling times, discussion times. This is what's on my heart. Can you give advice? Let's pray together. Let's study the Bible with somebody. This was awesome. See this? Yes. Then it says in verse 3, So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They carried torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, What is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas... The the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. This is very interesting to me. A detachment of soldiers is a squad of powerful Roman gladiator type soldiers that beat and kill and torture. Armed with armor, <laughs> with torches marching out to them. Jesus meets them with, I'm sure his eyes were probably red and swollen because we know in the garden he prayed all through the night and he had even uh, drops of blood broken with tears. 
and his capillaries in Luke. Dr. Luke noticed that blood happened because it was so traumatic and pressured and shocking what God was calling him to do. He was going, God, if it's possible, I don't want to do this. And he was wrestling to keep going. And it says the capillaries bursted in his sides. And little, and it's rare, but it's true. It's hematomas. hematomas and do, the doctor's talking about it. Yeah. It, it. Your capillaries can burst with sweat, so tiny sweat and blood will come down. And it actually says that in Luke's version. And you have to be under great trauma stress. And he was wrestling to do the right thing. So we know that he probably had grass in his hair, and he had a, just a peasant-type tunic. And he was probably red-eyed, and he just walked out, no threat. And his other three guys, they just kind of woke up, because remember, they were still sleeping. So they probably were just kind of drowsy. There's no threat. A big, powerful attachment mark <laughs> with weapons and torches. Wow. And, and then he goes, what does he want? And then I'm sure the commander went, Jesus of Nazareth. And he just says, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. Can I have a couple agile guys come up here that can fall to the ground for me? All right, come on, Wayne. Healthy guys. Come on up, Dalvin. Come on, Wayne. Come on. I need, I need a couple guys. I, I'm not going to take, I'm not paying your medical bills. I need you to fall down. Okay, so stand, so you, you get behind him, get behind him, get behind him. Dalvin, you guys are all behind him. You're the soldiers. Now there'd be 20 other people. Now, I don't want you to hurt each other, but you're going to march toward me. I'm going to come out, and I'm, I just got done giving the disciples guff again. Are you still sleeping and resting? I needed your help. You're falling asleep. You're not even learning the lesson right now. Don't fall asleep depressed. You need to pray like I'm praying because you're going to go through stuff like this, but you don't even get it yet. But wake up. Rise. The Son of Man is going to be prayed before the sinners. So then I come over and you guys walk up and I come in with the tunic. You walk up, yes, like this. Now, 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 now you stop. Now, now you'll be the commander. And these guys are all powerful Roman soldiers. And I go, what is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. Now Jesus says this, I am he. Oh my God. Okay, hold on, hold on. What, what, you know what? I am actually, let, let's give them another hand. I thought I was going to have to rehearse that. That was amazing. That's one take. I thought I was going to have to go, let's just get warmed up. You guys just threw down. Now, stop. Now, I want you to really think about this for a minute. In fact, can we do it one more time? It's, okay, walk up to me. Walk up to me. Walk up again. What? Wait, walk up to me. Go ahead. What is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Give it up for those guys. Great job. Guys, thank you so much. You guys, that's awesome. Okay. Now, now why I want you to see this, because you've got to understand how profound this is in the scriptures. A lot of people, you got to stop and go, what the heck's going on? There's, there's way more than these guys, and they're, they're big and tough. These four guys could take me down right now by themselves. They have swords and clubs and, and spears and torches. And they're coming to get me, and they don't believe in Jesus. They're following orders. Arrest him. Get rid of this guy that's causing dissension and disrupting Caesar's order. Follow the Pharisees. We don't care about them either, but let's just get this dude off the map. They're coming in to get him. They don't believe in Jesus, but Jesus... They're in the presence of God. They don't even know it. And he says, I am he. And even though they don't believe, and I promise they don't know why they did that. They drew back and they all fell. Now imagine with all their clanking helmets and everything, and about 20 of them, they would have all fallen on each other partly. Jesus is standing here. If you filmed it, it'd almost be comical. They had to fall, right? And they're clanked off, their helmet falls off, and they're like, and right there, and then they're thinking, what, what, I'm sure they're, they're going, what, what happened, what, why? They're like this. You know, and they're getting up, and, and, and you hear all this clanking, clink, 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 and they're getting up, and they're kind of looking around. I promise, because why did they fall back and then fall? They drew back and fell down, and Jesus didn't say, I am he. He just doesn't even have an exclamation point. He goes, I am he, the Son of God Almighty, Jesus Christ. Power is in the cross. It's foolishness, but because they're in the power of Jesus, 
They didn't even, even understand it was so powerful that they fell back. And they didn't even know what happened. I promise you, if you were there, they'd be getting up going. And then they go about their busy routine of what they are in life, and they're so busy, it's like the parable of the sower. At, they had an opportunity to realize what just happened. We just got knocked down and blew away by this guy that we, that we heard the Son of God. They could have went, there's something going on here. I'm not doing this. There's something going If you guys, if someone came up to you and said something and you fell back naturally, drew back and fell down, no one pushed you or no wind, you would either go, what, ha what? You would go, what? The and everybody else did it with you, a group. But then they grab him again. And then let's keep going. Let's see this. So it's like if you're busy working, you know, Zico, I love Zico. He's a great man of God. I love this dude. He drove, he, he, last minute I said, hey, come over to the house. We're hanging out with Travis and uh, uh, Aaron, and it was great, just had some brothers time, but he, he came, I told him, I joined him late, he came, and he, and he was coming a little late anyway, because I told him late, but he popped in, and he said, guys, saw him a little bit later, and I thought, I was driving to work, <laughs> and I, I'm not making fun of him, I go, who has not done that, who gets in a routine sometimes, you're driving somewhere where it's not, and you catch yourself, wait a minute, where am I going, we get in routines, <laughs> and I'm not trying to make fun of you, but it's just, it made me go, that's, I've done that. And I go, what's going on? Because our life consumes us. We're so busy, we don't even get a chance to feel the presence of God and understand God's working. These guys had a moment of awe, and they got back up, were confused, pulled themselves together, and they're probably afraid to speak up, and they just kept on their duty. Let's get him. And they grabbed him, and now look what happens. Again, in verse 7, they composed themselves, so it would have been comical. They all come back up together again. He's just standing there. I'm sure he's not mocking them. Jesus is kind of like, I mean, I don't know, it probably would take 30 seconds or what a minute. He's like watching and waiting for him to get back up. And then he, and then he asks them again. They kind of walk up to him. I don't, I'd love to see those expressions. Like, what are they doing? And he goes, who is he you want? Jesus of Nazareth said, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, let them go. Let these men go. Always thinking about others more than himself. And then in verse 10, Simon Peter had a sword, drew it, and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchias. Jesus commanded, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Now go over quickly to Luke 22 because we're going to look at this occasion because Luke's the doctor of the group and all four Gospels are eyewitness accounts of seeing what happened with Jesus. So why they have a little bit of a, things added, they never contradict the truth, but it's like if we all went out here and saw a gang fight outside and there's two guys fighting over the bikes and, and someone's jumping on somebody and then uh, uh, on the right another guy comes running up and throws a tomato on a guy's head, and another car smashes into something that, that's coming in, he skids. We, we'd all say there was a main fight. We'd get the main guys fighting, but someone say someone over here, you know what I mean? The story would all be truth, but, it, but there might be another viewpoint that's added, but it doesn't really, it's not relevant to dis, dis, disregarding the scriptures. It's just eyewitnesses. But he says this in Luke 22, uh, verse uh, 49. It says here, when, when Jesus' followers saw that was going to happen, uh, they said, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. So we know that the man, and, and sword in Greek means short sword. Put that picture up for you, will you, BB? Can you guys see that? Turn the lights off for a second. This is just an artist picture, but I just want to give you an idea how crazy this is. This is just, this isn't exact, this is an artist, an older artist is talking, showing Peter, he has a short serve. Look at all the chaos. They got Jesus here, they got back up, there's just chaos. G Peter cranks out of sea, but look at Micaiah, he's like an assistant to the high priest. He's just a lying guy going along with the program because he knows there's lies and everything because he was with Micaiah, he saw the scene. Well, he, he would probably be shocked. Peter's coming at him. Wow. And, and Peter's just, look, look at the intensity, but Peter slices his ear off, Right? And his ear gets cut off, and Jesus goes, enough! No more of this! And why does he do that? This, he didn't heal this guy by that guy's faith. That guy had no faith. That guy just had terror. Look at horror and terror was in that guy's face. <laughs> he, he goes, where'd the sword come from? Someone told me these were just fishermen peasants. I didn't know we were going to be sword fighting. <laughs> right? So we, there's, no, there's no faith in the name of Jesus. He's just probably all confused from getting up. He's like, what's up? We all got knocked down, and now this fisherman's coming at me with a sword. I thought these guys are supposed to be loving one another. What's going on? This is the wrong group. And Peter's just freaking out, right? And he goes, Hunk! cuts his ear off, and Jesus goes, enough! All who live by the sword die by the sword. Jesus heals him, gets down, I'm sure, and somehow the guy had to see him, 
And, and you know, when your ear's cut off, you're probably going to just grab it, and you're going to feel blood just gushing. And feel your earlobe right now. You can turn the lights on now, bro. Thanks. Ear, your ear. Feel your ear, right? You know there's an ear there, right? Now, if I slice that ear off and you feel a bunch of blood gushing off, there's just going to be a kind of a hole there, but you're going to know it's gone. Or if it's just hanging by a thread, you're going to be tripping out. And I've told you this, seven pounds of pressure, if you grab your earlobe and you pull up seven pounds like this, you can rip your ear off. It's just true. Seven pounds of pressure. Just grab your earlobe and go like this just a little bit. You can say, oh my gosh, that's easy. Grab it with your thumb and just go, and you rip up, it'll, pull, it'll rip your whole ear off. It's a true fact. Seven pounds of pressure, you pull up, you rip your ear off. If you're ever being mugged or someone's tying you up in the parking lot, if that's the last resort and you can get the ear, do it, because that'll stop the guy from grabbing you. I, I'm just telling you, especially ladies, if you get the ear, and if he's trying to grab you, like, oh, what are you doing? If he's trying to grab you, and, you know, you just grab that ear and just rip. It's going to get him. He'll stop. He'll go, ah! That's for free. Now, listen. I can beat a man in eight places and not leave a mark, but that was my old life. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding, bro. Now, he, he gets down and grabs the guy. He had to touch the ear. So he got down, and I believe they had, I believe Jesus looked at the man, and I believe the man saw Jesus. That was the chaos. He touches the ear and heals it. And, and, and all the chaos is going on, because they're all already confused, and it's dark. They're grabbing Jesus, manhandle him. we got to do it, because that's our orders. And, and so Machias is probably just like the little peasant servant guy. You know, he's assistant. And they just move on. Machias gets up. I don't know what happened after that. There's no writings. But I promise he went home sometime or somewhere, and he, and he felt the tremendous pain, but he didn't feel any more. But in your head, when you think you're hurting, you can think it's a lot worse. Like if you get a little cut on your head or your, like when I opened, when we were opening the trunk with Diego, I slit my head. It was just a little cut, but it was bleeding. Your head blows, it looks worse. And then the other day when I was with Diego, we, I opened the doors from Cassie's play, and both the doors opened, and they had the middle iron bar uh, painted brown, and I was opening the doors for everybody, and I walked right into it. <laughs> In front of everybody, I went, boom. See that cut right there? This was just the other night again, and Chad was behind me, and Chad goes, sorry. <laughs> that's a true shepherd. He could have said, that's going to leave a mark, but he was compassionate. He just goes, sorry, that happened. He knew that hurt, and I bound into it, and, you know, like a normal guy, I, I didn't really show much pain. I just kept walking. I'm fine. And I got outside, and Diego's like, and there's blood coming down my nose. <laughs> And then I said, can you go back in the auditorium and get a napkin? Because all the parents are coming out. I just didn't want to freak people out walking in there with blood. So he went and got me one. What I'm saying, it's vascular. But the ear, when you cut off the ear, it's really bloody. So when it went off, and he did that to Machias, Machias went home even with his ear. And think about when he's washing it off. He's probably thinking, I know something happened. So even when he's looking at the blood, he's probably sensitive to going, it's going to hurt. Maybe, I don't know what it's like. But he starts touching it, maybe washing it. But anyway, it's not hurting. But he's still psychologically going... But it's not hurting, so he's wiping a little bit. And then eventually, because you know, you'd think, is there a cut there? But if you keep moving, I don't feel no cut. And you wipe the blood off, right? And then you, eventually he'd be going, and he'd be washing it off. And he's like, and then he'd look at his tunic and be all soaked in dry blood. And he'd be going, what the heck happened? Why? Because Jesus healed the ear, but he didn't say clean the rope. He didn't use a detergent or do a wash. <laughs> so we know there'd be blood all over him, but a perfect ear. That had to blow Machias away. I don't know if Machias made it or not. Doesn't say anything else about him, but good night. That was another opportunity for God to awe him. And that's what he does for us. He may cut your ear off several times and you still don't get it. He may get in your presence and draw you back and you fall back in awe and wonder, but you still don't understand. I love you. I'm trying to get your attention to study the Bible and come all in. You believe in me, but you're not a disciple. And belief, intellectual belief is not enough. What's it take to get your attention? Humility. That's what it takes. So, man, we got to start early. We got to get the fellowship break done earlier. Put up the last picture real quick. I'm going to tell a story. See this picture? This is Bill Secor. This guy right here is Bill Secor. In 2005-ish, that's my, that's my dad with the glasses. That's me in the back. That's my son Chase when he's young. That's about, um, I don't know, 2004 or five. What is that, 12 years ago? So this man grew up with my dad since he was six in Indiana. They knew each other since they were six. He got Parkinson's disease. His wife's there, Louise. And he moved to Phoenix, and he had Parkinson's disease, so he got really thin and gaunt. And he started coming to our Bible talks. My dad started getting into it and started listening. And um, 
My dad eventually got baptized. And then Bill came, and he'd listen. And every time we'd talk about a subject, just I was just talking about Bible conversation, he'd bring up homosexuality. And I, I wasn't even bringing that up. I go, what? I go, he goes, is that a sin? And he, and he was like angry. And I, I, just, I just didn't understand. I go, what, what, what are you bringing that up for? I don't understand. And what has happened is his son was a homosexual lifestyle and his son committed suicide years of time before that. So he could never get past it. And he would always bring that up. And I'd say, you know, so he'd always kind of leave angry. And I, I didn't even want to, I wasn't even talking about that. But we got into the Bible eventually, but he, that would always derail him. But he then a little bit later, he broke his hip. He went into the hospital, and he was with my dad. And because he broke his hip, he, couldn't, he was already really weak from Parkinson's disease and very thin, so his, his vitals shut down and his trachea shut down. So they had to start feeding him intravenously. So he was so gaunt already and thin that he looked like a Holocaust victim. And his vitals, his vitals and his organs were shutting down. So, they had to, so basically, when you break a hip and you're older and you're already in problems, people know this. When you're elderly and you break a hip, it's no joke. You can, you know, so they, he's in the hospital and they're trying to repair him. He had to have like man diapers on because he couldn't, he was bad. And he started screaming out loud, no lie. Matt Sullivan was even in the church at that time in Phoenix. And he started screaming, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. This is a true story. I'm not exaggerating. Many disciples were in that church. Luke was in that church. Speckman, all, I don't want to go to hell. He's like, what's going on, Bill? My dad's going, what's going on? He goes, get Chris. I want to talk to Chris. So. They call me, and I come in, and he'd never been open. He'd always argue. And he, he told me what's going on. I said, okay, we, we, we got to start studying the Bible. And we didn't just do an emotional experience. Believe me, you don't just go emotionally. He's got to understand. He's got to understand what his sins are. He's got to understand and make a decision. Have you been a disciple of Jesus? Have you made Jesus Lord? And you can't just mentally say it. You've got to take responsibility for your sins. Yeah. We had to go through three marriages in 70 years. So it's the darkest study continued. We had to get into it. And this was a man that I've never seen that all the, gl the gloves were off. There was no pride. He was talking about all these stuff he'd done, the affair. Just we got into darkness, tried to help him see he's not a disciple. I had to teach the kingdom. We'd come in the hospital. I pulled Matt Sullivan in because I didn't want to be emotionally biased because he was so close to my dad. So I pulled Matt in and Matt got involved. Mark Garrido, who leads the church in Hawaii, he was in our church at that time. He came and we started studying with him. And we took three days because he had to, I said, Bill, this is not a game. You, you, you've got to understand it and believe it. And you got to act like, you know, and when you get out, you're going to seek first the kingdom and we'll figure out you're going to come to church. And this is what you do. Yeah. We got into darkness. He had three marriages that went south, divorced. And he got very open with me. And then the next day after I came, because we had to start just talking about Jesus. We had to talk about homosexuality. And I said, listen. God, you got to focus on you. You cannot, but the Bible does say homosexuality is a sin. It's never right in God's eyes. I'm sorry. That's God's word. Yeah. You're going to have to get over that. You're going to have to push through that. If that's going to stop you, that's not good. You can't disagree with God. You have the decision. So we got into his life. And then and after we've studied for three days, I finally came in. He goes, uh, I forgot one more thing. I forgot one more thing. You can turn the lights on. I, I lied. I mean, I, I, I forgot one more thing to tell you after he, we took a long sin list. He got so open. I lost it against your wife, too. And I just smiled and gave him a big hug. I said, bro, I love you. Talk about being real. He tells me, the husband, because he was realizing anything he could think. And he wrote down a list of 50 people that he was going to share with that he needs to tell to get out. He shared with the insurance, the insurance agents, and they're talking about his death because they didn't know he was going to get out. He shared with her. He shared with every nurse. He shared with everybody. He said, you know, listen. Then I said, we got to baptize him. He's in a hospital in a diaper with, a vital, with, with tubes in him. I go, they're not going to let us do that. I said, let's just pray and go tell him. So we went up and asked him. I said, listen, this is a man's faith. I'm a minister. This man needs to be baptized into Christ and under water. It's our faith. It's Christian Bible belief. They said he could. I call up our hit team. Because that's what disciples do. I said, hey, Mark, how you doing? Are you doing anything right now? He goes, hey, what's up, bro? Mark Rito's awesome. He's in the ministry now. But he was just a great brother anyway. He's married. He got baptized. I mean, with his wife, he got baptized in a pond in Phoenix in 110 degree weather that I thought he was going to come out with some kind of disease. There was so much moss and everything. I said, I, said if, I hope he'll stay alive when he comes out. He went on a lot. He did. I laughed, but he's just ready to get baptized. 
He got in some pond, it was mossy pond. But he came out, but I said, hey bro, can you, listen, I'm at the hospital studying with Bill and we're at the point right now, they said we can baptize him and he's ready. I said, do you mind, could you bring the trough, the baptism trough and the hose? He goes, I'm on it right now. He has a truck, so he gets a truck, he cranks, he gets a couple brothers, we're waiting, he's driving, he shows up at the hospital and the nurse's station's right outside the elevator. You know the, you know the elevator, when it comes up, usually you come out and see the nurse's station? So they come up in the nurse's station and there's a hose and they have a, a beat up Gordon hose because disciples always have beat up Gordon hoses, right? We never have the brand new ones. They're like someone barred, it's got a crack in it, tape over it, it doesn't matter. That's the way disciples work, right? Let's just get the water. Because, we, cause, because before we did that, I forgot to say, we we're trying to fill the bathtub up and as the bathtub was filling, I go, it's not big enough. Even though he's skinny, we're gonna kill him. I'm gonna have to squish him under. I'm not gonna be able to get him under. So I said, we're gonna have to bring a trough. So we brought the trough and the elevator opens up and I see this with the nurses because I'm waiting. They said, we're here and they come up. The elevator opens up and the nurses station here. They're looking at the elevator like you guys. And they have this huge horse trough, tin horse trough, standing up straight in the elevator, a bunch of disciples with a green hose and they all kind of get out like this. And they walk by with the, with the horse trough past the nurses station and I go, there with me. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. We walk over, we start filling it up and that picture, you can put that up again, uh, oh, you, you went out the park. Wait, you're taking a break? I didn't know we took breaks. <laughs> wow, BB's back there chutting it up a storm. I'm just saying, bro, you're supposed to pay attention. It's the word. I'm just kidding. He was back there fixing something technical. So this guy, this is right after he got out of the water. He looks, he was so, he had, he had like Parkinson's disease, so his face was partly paralyzed. So he couldn't smile. He was so bad off. When I walked him in, all the disciples came. From the church, I said, we're getting baptized. They didn't even know him. They were all interested in him. Hi, Bill, I'm going to be your sister. I'm going to be your brother. And, and, they, and he was just looking at him. And I whispered in his ears after three days. And I whispered right when we got him up there. We had to pick him up with the tube. And we had to carry him. He was like very gentle. And I was like, we got to be careful with this guy. We get to the trough. And I just whispered in his ear because I said, bro, you've studied the Bible for three days. You've made decisions. It's your faith. You've changed and you repented. Jesus is Lord. And I asked him the questions. I said, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin? lived a, a life on earth as the son of God and raised from the dead. Yes. What is your good confession? He's Jesus is Lord. He was, because he was hurt. I said, because of that and your faith, we can now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. All your sins will be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and added to God's eternal kingdom. According to Acts 2.32, the promise is still there for you, Peter says. We lift him up. We're all around him. There's like five guys. He's, del he's real light, but we're just being real careful. We put him in. And we put him under the water. He's got a diaper and a tube. Put him under the water, pull him up out of the water, bring him, wrap him in a towel, put him back in his wheelchair. And I whispered in his ear and I said, Bill, you're actually saved. You're gonna go to heaven. And his eyes rolled back in his head and went completely white. He went like this. And I saw like a million pounds come off him. So he's back in there. We were singing in the hospital. We put him back in, and then we had brothers and sisters visit him the next days. Every day we'd come read scriptures with him. And one brother, Rob Bolton, was reading to him, Matthew, and he looked over, and he was out. And Rob stopped, and Rob thought he died. And Rob shook him a little bit, and he woke up, and he said, no, I'm listening. And he kept reading. But we had brother and sister come in the hotel, I mean, in the hospital, and say, I'm your brother, Rob. I'm your brother, uh, uh, Joe. I'm your brother, Matt. And, and they'd introduce you, I'm your sister. And they, everybody was just coming and just saying, and he didn't even know any of us, mm -hmm. except me. And then I get a call. His wife goes home after she had to go home to change and I get a call and she calls me. She goes, they think he's not gonna be staying alive. They think he's going. I can't get there in time. I just went after two days to change my clothes and I'm not there in time. So I get in my truck and I'm rushing, driving over there and I'm speeding a little bit and a cop pulls me over. And I go, oh God, please help me. The cop pulls over and I said, listen, I know this is probably sound funny, I'm a minister and I'm, I'm going to a, a member of my church that's actually his wife just called me. They think he's not going to make it. No one's there with him. I, I'm just hoping I can be there with him so he, when he dies, he'll have someone that knows him. And he goes, well, let's just get this ticket wrote and we'll get you on your way. That's where you got to go. God ways aren't my ways. I would have thought God for sure is going to snap this one through. And I just went, wow, I'm still learning. So I just had to wait. And, I get, and then I get, this is a powerful lesson. I thought for sure, why, you know, I could go, why wouldn't you just, why wouldn't that cop be cool and give me an escort? He wrote me a ticket, too. And then I got to the driveway, and I ran up, and the elevators opened, and I saw the nurses, and they all had the look of, you just missed him. He, and they said he just died. And I went into the room, opened the room, went in there by myself, sat down, and he was dead. He was laying on the bed like this. You can turn the lights on now. And he was dead. And I just sat down, 
next to him by myself in the room, and I just put my head on his forehead, my hand on his forehead. He was still warm, but he was gone. And if you've ever been in the presence of someone dead, there was no, it, it, it's very clear the essence and presence is gone. It's just a lump of flesh, but it was still warm. And I just put my hand on his forehead and just, it was a trip for me because I knew his spirit had gone and he'd gone with God because he got right. And I went down and met his wife in the parking lot about 20 minutes later and she collapsed in my arms and we went from there. And uh, the, the, it was very powerful. But what I'm trying to tell you is that's being in awe of God. This guy had a stroke and he got humble. The stumbling block was he was mad at God for what God called sin because he was attached to somebody that was close and he was mad that God said this was sin. God is God. You've got to be personally about you. You can't question God. And that stumbling block, even God loved him enough, he cut his ear off. For his ear, it was giving him a stroke. I mean, giving him a hip. It broke his hip. Put him in the hospital where he started screaming out. I wouldn't have thought he was open. He started really thinking he's going to go to hell. He was screaming that out. That was him. That was his ear getting cut off. That was him being fallen back. The awe of God came when we studied. And when he went in that water, he understood this is it. And he died like the guy in the vineyard that works the last hour. So I know I went over, but I had to tell that story. So uh, it's, you want to see the awe of God. You've got to be walking with awe in you where when you step up to people, you come in the name of Jesus Christ. If you're a true disciple, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples. Jesus has got all the authority. He gives his disciples authority to go do it. Yeah. Make disciples. If you're hurting, you're doing terrible, I'm still powerful. You're not, but just be real. Yeah. But use my name and say how prayer and you're still fighting. And the name of God will still touch those people not because of how you're acting, but if you're humble and striving to overcome. If people are open and you're real, saying, I'm fighting, I'm not doing that well right now, but Jesus is my Lord, God Almighty. If they hear that and they're open, they're going to be in awe of God. It's not up to you. You just need to do what's right. So guys, I need us all to realize that we need to be falling back over and over because we are in the presence of God and we're in awe. You guys with me? Even if we go from the penthouse to the prison. Even... Even when Satan tries to make mind games in the temptations. And we need to say, does his name affect you? Yes, it does. Very powerfully. And God be the glory. Amen.